Hi, I'm Greg Corumbus. My guest at this time is Mark Mix. He's president of the National Right to Work Committee. He joins me to discuss efforts in Virginia and in the House of Representatives to reverse right to work laws. So, how serious are the threats, and what would actually be the impact, either in Virginia or nationwide, if workers were compelled to join labor unions instead of having the option to join or not join? And Mark, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure, Greg. Good to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, let's start in Washington. The House this week passed what's called the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, also known as the PRO Act. Uh, Here are a couple of members debating the issue, one from each side, of course. Uh, First is Democrat Mark Pocan from Wisconsin. The problem is there have been decades-long coordinated attacks on workers' right to join or form a union. It's time to make it easier for workers to have a voice in their workplace, and we've got some work to do. There are laws that make it harder to organize, and employees involved in organizing face barriers, including a one in five chance of getting fired. And then there's Republican Mark Walker of North Carolina. By repealing right to work laws, this legislation fails to protect workers from being forced into paying hefty union dues. With unemployment hitting record lows and wages hitting record highs, our workers should be able to keep their paychecks, not hand them over to corrupt union bosses. By changing the classification of the majority of independent contractors to employees, that's important, this legislation will restrict workers, create confusion, reduce opportunity, and then increase cost. So, Mark Mix, I'm guessing that you agree with Congressman Walker here. Uh, Both sides, of course, argue that they're on the sides of the workers. So what does the bill actually do? Yeah, the PRO Act is basically a smorgasbord of every single big labor wish list item that they've talked about for the last 20, 30, 40 years. It has everything in the kitchen sink. It has primarily of interest to us is it would repeal all 27 right-to-work laws. Those right-to-work laws that are in, in place in 27 states simply protect a worker's right to participate in a union, but also protects them from not participating if they choose to do so. Right-to-work laws are very basic. They say you can't be compelled to pay dues or fees to get or keep a job. Um, it's interesting that union officials talk about right-to-work, the idea of giving workers a choice as somehow being damaging to workers' rights. I don't understand that, but apparently I'm not as smart as most of those people that debate this issue. Uh, The fact is the bill also includes card check legislation, which basically eviscerates the secret ballot election in many instances. It has a prohibition against striker replacements when union officials call their workers out on strike for simply economic reasons, meaning that once a strike is called, an employer would have to shut down their business and cave in to demands. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to operate and and produce anything. Uh, So these are issues that have been debated in Congress literally over the last couple of decades. I've been at this for 30 years, and none of this is new. Um, It's all the same stuff, and it's designed to give union officials more power over workers. That's what it's about. And this notion that workers are fired for trying to join and participate in unions is really nonsense. That's a study that's been disproven, and it's just funny to hear the rhetoric on the floor over and over and over again, even though uh, it's just not true. Uh, The laws in the country protect workers' right to organize. It protects their rights to participate in unions. It actually punishes employers who do those things uh, that would stop that, and that's uh, Wisconsin federal law and it's Wisconsin state laws that have right to work. So it's a smorgasbord. It's all there. And uh, it got voted on yesterday and it passed. And that's uh, that's something to be concerned about. Passed, I believe, 224 to 193, mostly along party lines, but not entirely. There were a handful on on either side that crossed the aisle. It's expected to go nowhere in the Republican controlled Senate. Um, But uh, Just to follow up on what you said, you said there are plenty of laws in place to protect the right to organize for workers who want to. So when Congressman Pocan says that uh, workers who want to organize have their hands tied in those states or that a fifth of the the, uh, workers that uh, try to organize end up getting fired because of it, you're saying that's not true? That's right. Uh, Section 8A3 of the National Labor Relations Act lays down specific prohibition against employer uh, activities that would limit a worker's right to join or participate or organize in a union. I mean, the National Labor Relations Act that was passed in 1935 is allegedly 
supposed to protect workers. It has been enforced as a as a tool of big business and a tool of big labor to force workers into collectives and kind of dictate terms and conditions of employment. But the fact is there are prohibitions and protections for workers that want to organize and want to participate in unions. And, and there may be violations of that. Worker Employers may do that. And we've sued employers who have violated workers' rights. And we've sued unions. Uh, obviously, we've sued unions that have violated workers' rights. But there is protections not only in the federal law, but in the state law. For example, in Virginia, where they're trying to repeal the law there. Uh, Virginia Code 40.1-61 says that it's illegal for an employer to interfere with a worker's right to join or participate in a union. And and there's actually penalties in the Virginia law, misdemeanor crime, if, you, uh, if you're convicted of trying to interfere with a worker's right to join a union. So it's just not true. What this is about is a way for organized labor to collect more money uh, so they can spend more on politics, so they can get more money, so they can spend more on politics. It's a vicious cycle, and it all comes at a cost to America's workers. We're talking with Mark Mix, president of the National Right to Work Committee. And, Mark, I also want to follow up on something that Congressman Walker talked about. And I think uh, he's referring to some of the problems we've seen out in California where everyone's got to be an employee and you can't be an independent contractor. Uh, how would that be affected under this legislation? And, and talk about the the impact that has on people who consider themselves freelancers or otherwise. Yeah, that's an interesting piece of the legislation. Um, AB5 was a bill that was passed and now is the law in California, and it dramatically changes the way we perceive and the way, uh, for example, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers operate. It makes them employees of the company, which is completely the different than the model that uh, that lifted to use a pun and lifted uber and lyft to a point where they're competing in a in a free marketplace for transportation uh, uh services it's a really interesting idea i think the genesis of the regulation of that industry is certainly something that organized labor is said we've got to we've got to stop this because it's getting out of hand most taxi systems are unionized and i think it was the city of seattle that passed an ordinance that said basically you had to be a teamster member in order to drive a Uber or a Lyft car in their city, that got struck down. Um, But this is a a continuation of a drive to force more people into unions. If you're an independent contractor, uh, unions can't get to you because you control your own employment. You you control the hours that you turn your machine on if you're an Uber driver. Um, Obviously, Uber, the Uber company and Lyft, they they are algorithm companies. They sell an algorithm that helps provide transportation services, and and the drivers can choose when they want to be in a service and when when they're not. But the unions don't like that. And that's why the law in California passed, and that's why they have that in this law, too. Uh, It goes further. It talks about the franchisor-franchisee relationship where you have a local McDonald's owned by a local business person. And what the unions want is they want to be able to sue and bring the big McDonald's corporation into a violation that would occur at the local level when the big McDonald's corporation has no control over the workers at this local plant. But they want to make them employees called joint employer status so they can sue McDonald's corporation and, and get them to buckle and, uh, and, and get them to agree to unionize employees at the local franchisee. So there's a lot going on in this. It's, uh, the rhetoric is you know 30-second intervals of it, but when you really look at the impact on workers' rights when it comes to right to work and, and kind of small business rights and employees' rights when it comes to the joint employer, there's a lot in this bill. Mark, let's talk about Virginia now. It's where you're located. It's where I'm located. And so uh, we obviously have a very different complexion in the state government now. It's uh, Democrats running the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. And there's already been uh, quite a bit uh, done uh, and and passed out of the legislature. This one seems to be a little bit more contentious. So we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. And we'll get to the prognostication a little bit later. But what exactly does the Virginia legislation do? Does it look similar to what the U.S. House wants to do, or is it uh, significantly different? Indeed, it does. There's a there's a bill in the House, uh, House Bill 153, uh, introduced and patroned by Democratic Socialist Lee Carter from Manassas Park, who, which would basically just repeal, completely repeal the right to work law in Virginia, wipe it off the books, and say, you know, you can be forced to pay dues or fees to a private organization, i.e., a labor union, to work in Virginia, and if you don't pay them, you will lose your job or you can't get a job. That's what the the uh, the effect of the Lee Carter bill is. On the Senate side, there's a bill uh, SB 426 that's been sponsored by Dick Sasslaw, who is the Senate Majority Leader now. Uh, They have a one-vote majority in the Senate, and Dick Sasslaw is the uh, Majority Leader, and he's the sponsor of a bill that he says is not the repeal of the right-to-work law. He goes in and says, well, we're only going to make you pay up to a certain amount or a certain percentage of union dues or fees to keep your job. If you don't pay that certain percentage, then you lose your job. 
that in effect is a repeal of the right to work law as well. But Dick Sassel is a little more sophisticated than the Democratic Socialist from Manassas. He knows that repealing right to work is has a real big impact on Virginia, not only on independent individual worker freedom, but it also has a tremendous impact on the economic vitality of the state of Virginia. In fact, just last week, the governor's own economic development planning department issued a fiscal statement on the repeal of right to work. And they said, this is the governor's department, the executive branch saying it would likely cost Virginia 37,000 jobs and an economic impact of over $11 billion. That's their words. That's not mine. So you wonder, uh, you know, anyone who says, well, this is just a basic issue, you know, we need to force workers to pay dues because it's good for them. Well, it's not good for the worker, obviously, because we don't, we don't, we don't question why a worker doesn't want to join a union. It's their choice. If they want to participate in the union, they can in Virginia under the right to work laws. I mentioned there are protections in the law uh, that protect union activity. But what we can't comprehend and and understand is why they want to go after workers who have decided they don't want to be part of the union. And, you know, the ironic thing about the whole Virginia situation is the unions will say, well, we're forced. We have this tremendous burden of representing workers. Well, they literally not, Greg. They have a bill in the legislature that will unionize government employees across the Commonwealth. It was written by the unions. And guess what they have in that bill? They have a clause that says every worker must be represented by the union. So on one hand, they're saying it's unfair. On the other, they're actually writing a bill that would burden, quote unquote, them with, by, to represent every worker in a bargaining unit because they know that's where their power comes from. So there's a lot going on in Virginia. There's even more bills that would empower unions in the construction industry and but the right to work fight is a real fight, and it's coming down to the wire um, as we speak. Now, I've heard very different things out of Governor Northam uh, a while back. He said he didn't uh, support the the full repeal of right to work, which has been on the books in Virginia for decades. Uh, lately, he's seemed less committed to that position. Where do you think this is all headed? <laughs> I don't know. You know, Greg, it's, it gets hard to predict uh, p- political behavior, uh, not only in Washington, but also in Richmond and across the rest of the country. Uh, you know, Governor Northam, before the election, and Dick Sasslaw before the election, talked about how they, there's no energy, there's no, uh, any, no one's interested in going after the right-to-work law. Uh, but, you know, uh, politicians talk different before the election than they do after the election. And Governor Northam, you know, I'm not sure where he stands. What, I, what we do know is that Virginians are contacting him right now uh, by the tens and hundreds and thousands telling him to keep Virginia's right to work law and protect Virginia's right to work law. Hopefully, the bill won't get to his desk. Hopefully, we can stop it in the Senate or we can stop it in the House. Uh, that, that fight is not over. In fact, uh, next Tuesday is the so-called crossover deadline when legislation that was introduced in one House must make it over to the other house, otherwise it dies. So this Sunday, there'll be a hearing on the right to work bill in the Senate Fine- Senate uh, Commerce and Labor Committee at two o'clock on Sunday. Um, that bill will have to get out of the committee, get to the, I believe it's going to the Finance Committee, then it will go to the floor of the Senate, and it needs to move over uh, at that point on Tuesday by midnight, I guess, is the time. But so there's a lot of political maneuvering and, and, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of posturing on this right now, but it, there will come a time when we have to count the votes, and it's going to be really close. We'll be watching it. Virginia obviously getting a lot of attention over the gun debate and and several other issues, but this is another one very much at the top of many people's agenda. Mark, thank you very much for your time today. We truly appreciate it. My pleasure, Craig. Thanks for your interest in this issue. Absolutely. Mark Mix is president of the National Right to Work Committee. I'm Greg Corumbus reporting for Radio America.